Well, welcome to this podcast from the Aspen Chapel. My name is Nicholas Fisi. Uh, and today we're going to be uh, starting a new series, looking at the nature of time. And in this first uh, podcast, we're going to look at the nature of sacred time. Well, I don't know how many of you here for our harvest uh, festival last week. After harvest, we're in a very different time. And it certainly feels that way, you know, the weather changing, movement of the seasons. And I'm glad we did it when we did it. I mean, the next morning I got up, I don't know about you, but there was a big frost on the windows and the windscreen, and something had definitely changed. Um, It's interesting, in Japan, they talk about the seasons, uh, spring, summer, fall, winter, and then they say within each of those seasons, there is a spring, summer, fall, winter of that season. So we're probably in the spring of fall at the moment. And then we go into the fullness of fall, the summer of fall, and then the, uh, and then the fall of fall, and then the, the winter of fall. And that's quite a lovely thing, because the, the seasons themselves have a, uh, a, a, you know, moving within them. And today we're going to look at the subject of sacred time. Actually, it was a topic given to me by one of my gurus, Joe Scott. He said, I've got this idea, sacred time, you know. And it's always useful, actually, if you do have an idea, to come and give it to me, because I'm always looking as to where to go next. Um, and it was a lovely idea, this, this idea of, uh, of sacred time, because I think, you know, how we mark time in life can be confusing. You know, we mark it uh, with, with the past, present, and future. That's how we think about time. We have our calendars. We have our seasons. We have our ages. And we have our experience as well. And over the next few weeks, we're going to look at the nature of time through that quote uh, that I used last week from William Blake. Um, And the quote I used, it was for Harvest, really, but the the quote was, in seed time, learn. In harvest, teach. In winter, enjoy. So we're going to explore that, that whole idea of what happens during time. And it gives us an indication as to how we can look at time in relation to the experience of living. That's what I want to do. You know, we sow seeds, we watch them grow, we reap the harvest. And it's true for so much of our experience of life. You know, in relationships, in family, in business, in community, there's that seasonality of what's going on. And it'll give us a template to look at both time and also our own activity within that time. William Blake actually wrote that first hymn that we sang today, and it mentions time right at the beginning. And did those feet in ancient times walk upon England's mountains green? I I knew a vicar, uh, actually the one who married me, who refused to sing Jerusalem at any of his weddings because he said the answer to that was obviously no. But, but we did actually persuade him to have it at our wedding, funny enough. But, but I think it, it poses an eternal question, you know, and did those feet in ancient times walk upon England's mountain screen? The eternal question is, you know, where is the divine present in time? That's the question that's really being posed there. Where is the divine present in time? You know, and was the holy lamb of God on England's pleasant pastures seen? It says England, but it could be anywhere. It's where Blake was. It was here for him, and it's, it's here for us. You know, is the divine seen in reality, in time? It's a big question. You know, and did the countenance divide shine forth upon our cloudy hills? And was Jerusalem builded here among these dark satanic mills? Is there a d- divine within the chaos of life? You know, they always say, the Chinese always say, you know, blessing, the blessing may be, never live in interesting times. May you never live in interesting times, is no old Chinese blessing. And I do feel we are living in interesting times, unfortunately. You know, where is the divine within the chaos of life? And then it goes on to say, you know, bring me my bow of burning gold. You know, I always love these words. These words totally inspire me. You know, if you're living, you know, if, where is the divine in life? You know, what, you know, where is it in these chaotic times? And therefore, you know, my task, bring me my bow of burning gold, bring me my arrows of desire, 
bring me my spear, O clouds unfurl, bring me my chariot of fire. You know, let me be in that place where I can engage with the divine. I will not cease from mental fight, nor will my sword sleep in my hand till we have built Jerusalem in England or America's green and pleasant land. It's so evocative. It's such a challenge. It's, you know, I always feel when I listen to that, totally opened up by that. And I just want to go, yes, yes. And it, it does mean a huge amount. You know, I, to me, I, I said, uh, Heather and I had it at our wedding. And it challenges about the nature of our time. It challenges about the nature of our time and what we're going to do with it in our lives. You know, what are you going to do with your time in your life? Now, you compare that with Shakespeare's Macbeth saying, tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Out, out, brief candle, life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. And we all feel that as well sometimes. And, and the contrast between those two ideas, out, out, brief candle. Ward, I, I'm sure you should share that with us. So, you know, it would look like it was worth saying. <laughs> You'll just put an end to it right there. That was Macbeth, and he was, but Macbeth was in dark times. Macbeth definitely lived in interesting times. We could sing Jerusalem, and we won't, but, but Jerusalem, you, you've got that choice in our lives between those two things. The two ideas, and it's a challenge that we face as we confront, we, as we confront the time that we have available to us. But in some ways, we cheat ourselves when we just look at time in this way. You know, who here has ever been in the future? Okay, right, let's try again. Who here has ever been in the past? <laughs> you can't. Because the past and the future only exist in our minds. The past and the future, you can never live in the past, you can never live in the future, some of us try, but you can't. You can't live in the past because it only exists in our minds. All that truly exists is the present. And we only ever experience life from the position of the present. And that's so important when looking at time. It's a cliche, but there is only now. I love that expression. You know, we use it a lot. For the time being, for the time being, I'm going to be in this job. For the time being, it, it actually expresses the actual essence of what time is. It is the beingness. The time being is in the present. It's always the time being. All being, we're going to get a bit, you know, sort of in our heads here, but all being is time. And all time is being. Being and time are are wound in the same way, the whole idea of that time being. I love that wonderful line from L.P. Hartley's book, The Go-Between. They're making a, a second film of it now. You know, that wonderful, like, the past is a foreign country. They do things differently there. And, and you can't live there. I, I, you know, we try to separate out time. We're desperate, even in the church, you know, we try and separate out time. In the church calendar, would you believe, insanely, it is split between ordinary time. You know, when you look in the church calendar, when you try and organize things, there's what's called ordinary time, which is the time after Christmas to Lent, and from Sunday uh, after uh, Pentecost until Advent. After Christmas till Lent, and then from the Sunday after Pentecost to Advent, it sort of says there's a special time, which is really Christmas and Easter, and everything else is just ordinary. And that's really, uh, to some extent, how we think about time and our lives, and it's, it's bonkers. 
you know, we tend to have our special times. Normally, our special times are when we're having what we call a good time. That is our special time. And then we have times that we would rather forget, quite frankly, when we're depressed or in pain or just feeling blah. You know, we value good time and we just tend to get through the rest. That's how we look at it. But the truth is that the distinction, it's purely our own distinction based upon our perspective of life, what we like and what we don't like. It's a totally arbitrary distinction. In the Old Testament times, life was split into what was sacred and what was profane. That, that, it, that's how it all worked. And literally, that which was immortalized, set apart, dedicated or holy, that which was sacred, and that which was profane, literally profanum, outside the temple, profanum, that's where we get the word outside the temple. And so you had all the stuff that was inside the temple that was sacred, and all the stuff that was outside the temple was profane, was, was, was not sacred. And when Jesus died, one of the things that happened was that the veil of the temple was split in twain. You read, if you read it, it says, you know, Jesus died, and there was big thunder, it all went dark, and the veil of the temple split in twain. And what's significant about that is that the curtain of the temple was that which separated that which was holy from that which was profane, that which was not holy. And that was torn apart. And Jesus' death represented the end of the distinction between holy and profane, saying, actually, everything is holy. That is that distinction. Everything is holy. Or as Richard Raw puts it in his title of his book, everything belongs. There is nothing that doesn't belong. Everything has a holiness within it. You can't say that the altar's holy and the pillars are not. They tried to say that, but actually what Jesus was saying was, it's not. It's all part of a unity, all part of the same divine nature. And it's exactly the same with time. There's no saying that this time is ordinary and this time is special, that this time is good and this time is not good. It's all sacred. It's all precious. It's all now. All of this now is precious. Don't discount any of it. It's always precious. You know, those times when we're depressed or, or hard, or it's hard or we're in pain or are just as sacred at those times when we think of as being special and, and treasured. Because, you know, there are two great sayings from the Buddhist Dharmapada. First saying is, a good man must suffer until his goodness flowers. And that's lovely because it gives you a sense that something is being built or sown in that, that sacred time. And also, what hurts you also blesses you. Darkness is your cradle. Darkness is your cradle. And the distinctions we make are purely ours and arbitrary. That, that very famous line from Scott Beck, Peck's book, The Road Less Travels, it starts off, life is difficult. Life is difficult. And, you know, in the acknowledgement of that, you can, you can make difficulty sacred. We can see all time as being sacred, not caught up in the partiality of our feelings. To enter into time in this way is to enter into sacred time, to enter into that moment now, whether it's painful and dark or whether it's glad and happy. It is all as important as sacred. Because, you know, Macbeth is right, out, out, brief candle. What are we going to do with this short moment that we have? You know, we say it's going to end badly for all of us. No one's going to escape it. And it is brief. And it is so important to capture it, to realize it. Do you know the last place you want to realize this? The last place you want, you better get this, best to get this now, because the last place you want to realize this is on your deathbed. And you will realize this on your deathbed. When I'm saying this now, you will get this at one point, but you don't want to get it and go like that. You know, that's the last thing that you want. 
You know, what are we going to do with the short amount of time allotted? You know, to worry and fear and introspect on our pain, or to say, you know, you know do you do that? Do you, do, do, do you sort of get all worried about what's going on and awfulness of your pain? Or do you say, I will not cease from mental fight, nor will my sword sleep in my hand till I have built Jerusalem in this green and pleasant land? You know, there's no competition, really. You know, you can noodle on with pain, or you can get that and realize that that pain has its own sacredness about it. Our time is limited, but we are here now. And you know, this is our time. This is our, all of us, our time now. And our challenge is to enter into the sacred time and meet the divine in all that we do. If we can do that, if we can do that, then will the countenance divide and it will shine forth on our clouded hills, and Jerusalem will be builded here among the darkness of the world. So much of our time is spent waiting for it to happen, waiting for it to start, waiting for the good bit to arrive, waiting till Christmas, waiting till whenever. Well, you know, the thing is that this is the good bit, in a sense that it is as good as all the other bits. You just have to make it so, with all your perceived lacks and wants that, that go along with it. Because the truth is that in eternal time, in eternal time, in sacred time, in this eternal time now, you want for nothing. You, you do want for nothing. You do know that. You want for nothing eternally. All that you have is in that consciousness that you have right now here. It doesn't matter about that aching leg. It doesn't matter about that pain, and it doesn't matter that I won't shut up quite yet. It is, it is right now, that eternal time. It is, it is in this moment, just by being alive, we are meeting the eternal. As it says in that hymn, Immortal Invisible, Immortal Invisible, God only wise in light, inaccessible, hid from our eyes. You've got to get that. You know, for now we see through a glass darkly. But then face to face, it says in Corinthians. Now I know in part, but then I shall know even as I am known. Those now and then, now I live, see through a glass darkly, and then I, they're all within this sacred time. You can choose to see darkly or face to face. It is both in the same moment. It is not when you die. It is in the same moment now. We're lucky here because, you know, we have nature around us. We have the chance of seeing face to face. You know, every time we drive in, every time we go out into the mountains, we see it. But in truth, we need to realize that we are always living in that sacred time. That this now is all there is for you and all there ever will be. So you might as well get used to it. That's why we study meditation. That's what, you know, we to try and stay in that sacred now. Or to quote another Richard Raw's book, The Naked Now that naked now, where we stand in front of the divine with nothing in the way. Stand in front of the divine, naked. There's a great story, actually, of Roosevelt and Churchill. Churchill, during the war, went to stay with Roosevelt. You know, you probably know that. And they had a big conversation. It was during the war, trying to persuade America to get involved and all that sort of business. And Churchill always had a bath early in the morning. And he had his bath in the morning, and he got out out of the bath, stark naked, stood there, and at that moment, Roosevelt opened the door and walked into the room, and wheeled himself into the room. And Roosevelt said, oh, I'm most terribly sorry. And Churchill stood there and said, there is nothing to be sorry about. The Prime Minister of Great Britain has nothing to hide from the President of the United States. And <laughs> <laughs> just stood there, you know. And we have to have the same attitude. You know, we have to have that same attitude. In the Garden of Eden, always good to come back to the Bible. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and his wife were both naked. And they felt no shame in that time. Yet the, when the woman saw the fruit of the tree was good to eat and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. It's often seen that what drove them out of the Garden of Eden was not having eaten the apple, but having 
hid themselves from God afterwards. The shame that they experienced, the hiding from God, was what drove them out. As Thomas Merton said, to hide yourself from God is altogether too much privacy. And in that moment, we cannot hide ourselves. We hide from sacred time. We create distractions. We deny it. We live in our minds when reality, the reality is that it's offered to us eternally and at all times. We're offered it now. And now, and now, and, and all the nows that make up what we think of as past, present, and future, but it's always, in our experience, just now. And it's only when we open ourselves to the eternal and say yes, that the Holy Lamb of God will be seen in this green and pleasant land. Let's pray. And we pray that we may have our eyes open and be willing to receive the moment as it comes to us with all that it comes with. May we not hide ourselves, whatever we do. May we give ourselves to our moments. May you enable us to make use of the time that we have. That we may be part of the unfolding change in consciousness. The unfolding transformation of the world and we do pray for our world we pray for this at the time of the elections that you will guide our leaders and guide us as we go forward we pray for all those suffering and in difficulty those in prison those hungry abused pray for the difficult parts of the world where there's trouble especially think of the people of Aleppo at the moment. Pray for the leaders around that situation, that you will open their eyes to the preciousness of life. And we pray for those who are in our own community who are not well. We pray for Philip Hodgson and Patricia Hill, for Barbara Orcutt and Will Welsh, Carly Nelson, Maureen Hirsch, for Elise Strickland and her husband, Carter, John Waller, Erin Tully, Betsy Radcliffe. Pray for Valbrit Karlberg. Especially, we pray for a family, Cherise, battling with recurring stage four cancer, and her daughter, Cheyenne, only 14 years old, who's been put in an incubated state with organ failure as a result of toxic shock syndrome. We really pray for that family. Pray that your healing touch will somehow reach them and, and they'll receive some form of healing. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm just going to read uh, just a short passage from T.S. Eliot's The Four Quartets, which really addresses this subject of time. And, um, and then I'm just going to see if anybody has anything they'd like to say or ask a question or or reflect on time. I'm saying this now, so it's a pre-med, so you can think, well, do I want to say something or not? But uh, do think about it. Is it maybe something you want to talk about time? I, or, or from last week as well, if you were here. So this is from the Four Quartets. Time present and time past are both perhaps present in time future, and time future contained in time past. If all time is eternally present, all time is unredeemable. What might have been is an abstraction, remaining a perpetual possibility only in a world of speculation. What might have been and what has been point to one end, 
which is always present. Footfalls echo in the memory down the passage which we did not take towards the door we will never open into the rose garden. My words echo thus in your mind. But to what purpose disturbing the dust on the bowl of rose leaves, I do not know. Other echoes inhabit the garden. Shall we follow? Quick, said the bird. Find them, find them, round the corner, through the gate. In our first world, shall we follow the deception of the thrush into our first world? There they are, dignified, invisible, moving without pressure over the dead leaves in the autumn heat through the vibrant air. And the bird called in response to the unheard music hidden in the shrubbery. And the unseen eye beam crossed, for the roses had the look of flowers that are looked at. There they were as our guests, accepting and accepted. So we moved and they in formal pattern along the empty alley into the box circle to look down into the drained pool, the dry pool, dry concrete brown edges. And the pool was filled with water out of sunlight and the lotus rose quietly, quietly. The surface glittered out of heart of light and they were behind us, reflected in the pool. Then a cloud passed and the pool was empty. Go, said the, boo, said the bird, for the leaves were full of children, hidden, excitedly, containing laughter. Go, 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 said the bird. Humankind cannot bear very much reality. Time past and time future. What might have been and what has been point to one end which is always present. <laughs>